Hi, Redeemer. It's Bill and Michelle Van Loon, and we are back with you to explore the Bible that Jesus read, which is not the New Testament, but the Old Testament, and, and share a little bit about um, just all the different components and what they bring to us. And as a reminder that God doesn't change. And so the God of that we see revealed to us through the Old Testament is the God that we can get to continue to know through the person and work of Jesus and the writings in the New Testament. So a little bit about us, thought we'd just share a, a little bit of background. Um, we're both from Chicago and we moved here a little over a year ago. Uh, Bill is by trade an IT project manager um, and he's he's been in the information systems field since computers were great big machines that filled great big rooms and needed lots of air conditioning um, and he has um, continued to learn and grow in that area for decades. So lots of experience and also um, has a theological background. Um, I am a writer by trade. I've written six books, lots of articles, curriculum, just about everything that goes along with a long time writer's life. Um, and I'm really, really grateful that I have had this opportunity to write for the body of Christ all these years and bring my Jewish background and love for scriptures and love for Jesus, my Messiah into my work um, on the printed page. So we have three kids, we have two grandkids and we miss them all very much. So with that, I wanna take a moment to, to pray for our time together and then I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Um, so Lord, I thank you that you do not change, that you speak to us through your word and you sing over us, you sing us to life with your word and with all that you are. I am grateful, Lord, for this time together with friends from our new church. And I pray, Lord, that we can be stretched and strengthened and encouraged as we dive into your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I, oh sorry, you go, go oh, ahead. No, go ahead. This is- going to throw it over to me. Oh, not yet. Oh, I have okay. an introduction. All right. I'm almost ready to throw it over to you. Oh, okay. Okay. My husband of 41 years, we, we obviously have not um, <laughs> nailed the mind reading totally, but um, I, I saw not long ago, um, a Jewish commentator said that he believed that God composed the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, we call the Pentateuch, which is a Greek word. Bill will get into that more. That God composed them as a musical score and used it to sing the world into existence. And honestly, most of us, when we think of the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch or the Torah, we think of it as history, maybe, and rules or commands most definitely because there, there are many rules and commands in those five books. But if we limit ourselves to approaching those books as just history or just rules, we miss the poetry and the music of those first five books. And I believe that that music is echoed throughout the New Testament. You can look, for example, at the beginning of John, John 1 in the New Testament, in the Gospels, 
that begins in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And if you don't hear the echoes of creation and the way that God sang the world into life at the beginning of Genesis 1, um, you're missing something really, really powerful and precious. And scripture works like that, always in harmony and always to draw us in into relationship with God. So the foundation of this song is the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. I'm going to throw it over to Bill now. And he's going to walk you through that, that first foundational piece of the Old Testament. Take it away. The uh, first significant piece of the Bible Jesus read. And this is the Torah that Jesus knew. It's the Torah that Paul the Apostle knew. It's the Torah that the other Apostles knew. And many, many other Jews knew at the time that Jesus lived. And, and so I begin. So Torah, uh, to recap uh, for last week, doesn't really mean law. How it got to mean law, it's a little longer than the time that we, than we have today to talk about that. But Torah means instruction or learning, okay? It also has another name. Uh, the Pentateuch uh, is the, uh, the Greek term for it. Penta meaning five. And there are five books in the Torah. They are also called the five books of Moses. And they are also called in Hebrew, the Kumash, which comes from the Hebrew word for five, with, which is Hamesh. So the... Authorship of the Torah is traditionally Moses. That's why we call it the five books of Moses. Uh, although there's plenty of third person language uh, in reference to Moses in those five books. Um, I don't have time to go into authorship and discussions around that and criticisms of it and studies of it. Just not what we want to do here. But suffice it to say is there's probably more than one writer of the Torah, Moses being the primary writer and quite possibly, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, that Joshua helped him with it as well. Now, when did Moses do this? During the Exodus, which is over 5,000 years ago. How did he do it? Scrolls, parchment, things like that. And he put them together, and just before he dies, and that happens in, De in Deuteronomy, um, he tells the story again and reiterates. And I'm going to go into what Deuteronomy does here in a little bit. So let's begin with the first book of the Torah, which is Genesis. We call it Genesis usually. The Hebrew word is Bereshit, which means in the beginning, like Michelle pointed out at the beginning here. Genesis deals with creation, Adam and Eve, the flood, the patriarchs, and yes, the matriarchs of the Hebrew people, and ends with Jacob taking his family to Egypt. It also contains the commandment in, uh, of, of circumcision, and God's promise to Abraham that he would receive the land of Israel and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in heaven, a huge influence on the world. The second book of the Torah is Exodus. The Hebrew word for that is Shemot. And that really means names. And it refers to the names of the Jews who entered Egypt with Jacob. It deals with their exile, their slavery and suffering, the life of Moses, and his initial prophecies, the 10 plagues, the exodus, and the golden calf. It also describes revelation at Mount Sinai, where the Hebrew people received the 10 commandments. One thing I want to point out about that is we call it the 10 commandments. Uh, when they're read in the scriptures, the, it's the, com the word commandment isn't there, at least at that point in time. It's actually the 10 words. That's, that's something I'll get to in a little bit too with Deuteronomy. And we also have the story of the written Torah in Exodus. Exodus closes with the building of the tabernacle, the Mishkan. It's a portable temple that housed the Ark of the Covenant containing the tablets Moses brought down from Sinai. 
The third book of the Torah is Leviticus. In Hebrew, it's Vayikra, and it means he called. It's probably the hardest or least interesting of the five books because of its subject matter. Now, I don't share the opinion that it's hard, and I don't share the opinion that it's not interesting. It is very interesting, and um, I enjoy reading it every year. Okay, I read it once a year, and it's really nice. The subject matter is, is a little difficult in that sense, really applies uh, to the, the exercise of priesthood and how God informs him of the details of the laws regarding festivals, the priests, and temple service. Much of the Jewish code of morality, ethics, case law, and charity appear here in Leviticus, uh, including, as Jesus put it, and he says this, the second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And that's found in Leviticus 19.18. So here we have the words of actually Jesus using the law or the Torah to explain how to live a righteous life. The fourth book of the Torah is Numbers, or Bamidbar, which means in Hebrew, in the wilderness or in the desert. It details the travels and the battles and the struggles of the Jews during their 40 year sojourn in the desert after the Exodus. It records the census of the tribes. And that's where we get our, you know, we get a lot of names, a lot of numbers. Okay. Uh, the positioning of each tribe as they traveled and as they camped. Uh, Korah's rebellion and the events surrounding sending spies to Israel or sending spies into the promised land to scope it out uh, to find out what it was really going to be like when they, uh, they moved in. Uh, Bamidbar, or Numbers, ends with the capture of the East Bank of the Jordan River and the subsequent settlement there of the tribes of Reuben and Gad. There's a whole story around how that happened too in Numbers as well. The last book of the Torah is what we call Deuteronomy. It's actually titled Devarim, which means words. It refers to Moses's address uh, to the Jewish people before his death. The prophetic farewell uh, includes things like rebuke, encouragement, blessings and curses, warnings and prophecies. And in it, many commandments that would only apply in the land of Israel and that govern the interaction with other nations are explained and new commandments are given, many of which concern the courts and the justice system that the Hebrews were to set up. The first and greatest commandment that Jesus points out is given, and it applies at all times everywhere. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. It is also as the Shema, is known as the Shema by the Hebrew people, by the Jewish people, and it's the closest thing we have to a Jewish creed. And after his farewell, Moses wrote 13 complete copies of the Torah, gave one to each tribe, because there was 12 of those, and placed one copy in the ark. The Torah closes with Devarim, or Deuteronomy, with the death of the greatest of all prophets and the most humble of all men, and that was Moses. That's it. So as Bill was sharing, we hear these words and we can, we can recognize that as we read, there's, there's some parts of the law in the Torah that apply specifically to um, temple worship, for example, you know, about the, the the, the nature of the kinds of sacrifices and the timing of the kinds of sacrifices. And if there is no temple, um, those, those can't be observed in the same way. Um, history brought us to a place where um, as, as the Jewish people ended up in exile, where they had to figure out how to be a people and honor the intent of those laws without being able to do what was in the law. And um, it, it is out of that context that Jesus came in years after the, after the exile um, 
after the Jewish people were exiled from the land and he went back to the Torah to tell us again how to live, not in terms of sacrifice, but in terms of obedience, in terms of humility, in terms of relationship with him. And he points to these commands in the New Testament, love God, love your neighbor, as kind of the core of who we are as people. And if we want to know what that looks like, we look at the Torah. If we want to be able to know what God is like, the one who sang us into life, we look at the Torah. What does he like? What doesn't he like? What does he want from the, his created ones? What doesn't he want? It always circles back to the character of God and these wonderful boundaries that he's created for us to be able to be live in blessing with him and in harmony with each other. Could I, could I stop you for that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. One thing I want to point out, you're very right. One thing I also want to point out is oftentimes we just take the Torah or the law or instruction or whatever, and we say that was given and that's how the people lived. Well, it's just the reverse. The first thing that happened was that God established a relationship with Abraham and mm -hmm. took him toward the land. And then came the Torah. So it's important to realize that relationship was established first. And then came the law so that God could show people how to properly relate to him. And so how we could be shown how to properly relate to one another and how we could relate to him as well. So him to us, us to him, and to each other. So, okay. good word. Well, we're supposed to be dialoguing a little bit, and so, um, so thanks for that. Well, I wanted to leave you guys with um, kind of a core prayer that is um, the essence of what I learned as um, a little girl. I grew up in a, a Jewish home. Um, Bill's mom is Jewish as well, and. This is for most most Jewish kids that learn how to pray. This is this is kind of prayer 101. And it is from Deuteronomy 6, beginning at verse 4. And it'll be familiar, I think, to many of you. Um, I will read it and say a couple of things and pray for us. And um, then we'll be done. So thanks for hanging with us. Beginning at verse 4. The word is, starts, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The first word of that section is the word hear, which is the word Shema. And most of us learn the prayer. We, we call it the Shema and it's, it's prayed by observant Jews multiple times every day and it's um, said that this should be the last words on your lips as you are dying. Um, if you have that opportunity. If you have that opportunity. Um, the, the idea here is that we are invited into a relationship with God and his words, his commandments form both the melody and the harmony of our lives, that um, as we're walking, as we're talking, as we're living our lives, we're living them in company and in fellowship with God and with each other, that, that this, is, this is how things were meant to be. And um, 
They were meant to be this way in Eden and they're meant to be this way in Sarasota. Um, and it is Jesus who, who through his spirit writes these laws, writes this word on our hearts. May God give us ears to hear and a willingness to stay in conversation with him. I'll pray. So Father, I ask that we can learn to hear and obey, that we can love your word and love you as the author of that word and the singer of that word, the orchestra of that word, that you are calling us into fellowship with you and that that is a good and spacious place. I thank you that you make a way for us to come back to you, that you've shown us what is good. And because of the self-giving love, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, your only begotten son, we can live in fellowship with you. I am grateful, Lord, for the people of Redeemer, and I pray, Lord, that you can help us to all go deeper and go wider in our relationship with your word and with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank next you. Time, yeah, next time it's the prophets, the Nevi'im. So we look forward to doing that again. Thank you uh, to everybody at Redeemer. Uh, has allowed us to do this it's it's an honor and privilege and we hope you're getting something out of it you know we uh, uh, we're also open to ideas so please you know uh you can send ideas to us as well um, yeah okay. and 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 bouquets of flowers or <laughs> cash <laughs> or complaint letters, complaint letters <laughs> make yes. it constructive so constructive complaints yes yeah. yeah. That's, that's a good thing. Thank yeah. you guys.